class one genes. So we actually came along and told the transplant people what the MHC was for. They, most of them didn't acknowledge it in their lifetime. They really didn't like that very much to have two sort of brash young guys come along and uh, tell them what they've been doing all their life. But uh, that's the way it works. Um, of course, this is what happens. The virus gets in and under coats and makes more protein. Some of the protein is not made all that well. Gets chopped up in the proteasome. Goes across into the endoplasmic reticulum, which associates with this stuff, and it's carried to the surface in the tip of the MHC molecule, and that's what the T cell receptor sees. Um, we got the, the we, we sort of made the initial naive discovery. Then. Thousands of people worked on it and we got the Nobel Prize. It was a really good deal. That's one of the bits of advice in, uh, in, in, in my beginner's guide to the winning the Nobel Prize. Discover something really big and discover it early. And also live a long time. You have to wait some time. Some, uh, Peyton Rouse waited 55 years to get the Nobel Prize. So live well, don't drink too much, not too much <laughs> alcohol, and be careful when you go sailing around Geelong. You can, uh, you can really get into trouble, it seems. Uh, these are the guys getting the Nobel Prize. I won't go into all this stuff. After you get the Nobel Prize, you don't get any more prizes. Uh, that's it. Uh, you get painted. That, my wife says I look like that at breakfast. That was published by, that was painted. That's Rick Amor, who normally does decrepit industrial landscapes. Uh, <laughs> Melbourne painter, wonderful painter, actually. And, uh, and you, get, you, you get on a stamp, at least in Australia. Uh, you have to be dead to get on an American stamp. And I've just had, I recently had a street named after me. This is, uh, that's Bogger Road Jail in the Brisbane. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I mean, this is the veterinary world, right? What, if, you, if the camera had been turned the other way, he could have photographed a new veterinary precinct building, which is replacing the old ARI. But of course, given who we are and the culture we come from, the jail. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, flu virus, we've already been through all that. Of course, the swine flu, the one that's been sweeping the world, the swine flu, basically, is uh, it seems to be a recombinant between an, an Asian flu uh, pig virus and a Mexican pig virus. How did they get together? Well, someone imported some Asian pigs to Mexico, presumably. They mixed up. And what we've got is a virus, that, a high growth virus, which also has uh, certain features that tend to defeat part of the innate immune response. And that's Currently, um, uh, we're currently writing that up, actually. And I think there's also some other people who've got somewhat similar results. Um, this was a going, uh, the swine flu going through humans. Uh, got around the world very fast, got here very fast. Currently, it's very quiet in Australia. We're not seeing anything very much at all. Um, uh, I think Canada's getting a, or getting a bit of H3N2. Um, there's been some deaths in Britain. Um, they've been complaining about not having enough vaccine. So we don't know what will happen with this, uh, whether it will go any further. It's going to burn out or what? It has displaced the former seasonal H1N1, which is kind of interesting. One of the things we don't understand, really, is when a new flu virus comes in, these two viruses don't cross-react at all at the serological level. When a new flu virus goes, comes in, why is it that it displaces the flu virus that was circulating previously? Uh, the cross-reactivity in the cellular immune response, but uh, uh, why does that happen? Um, here we see uh, um, the, the vac with vaccination. The vaccine actually worked extremely well. It, it's actually extremely immunogenic, uh, particularly the CSL1, which is BPL inactivated. It's also rather reactogenic. That it means it creates a fair amount of cytokine chemokine response. And as you're probably aware, we've had a bit of problem with the CSL vaccine, uh, which is a very good vaccine as far as immunity goes, but it was causing a problem in, in under five-year-olds in Western Australia. And some of the under five-year-olds, because of the uh, tendency to cause fever, were getting convulsions. And so that virus, we're not, that's no longer being used in, in young kids. Uh, the Sanofi Pasteur vaccine, which is formal and activated, uh, not as good an immunogen, but doesn't give that problem, is available for that use. Um, and uh, why this is such a good, uh, good vaccine at the moment that we really don't understand. It's uh, quite interesting. 1918-19, um, um, part of the reason for all the deaths in 1918-19 could have been systemic shock. This was first put forward by Malik Peres, who was studying the, uh, 
the original isolates in Hong Kong of the H5N1 from humans and realized there was a lot of cytokine production. So Malik proposed that with some of these extremely severe acute influenza infections, we actually may get damage due to the cytokine chemokine response, which is causing vascular leakage and causing acute respiratory distress and death. And there's some thinking that that may have been a substantial factor. That's the, the normal uh, death curve for flu is this, the very young and the elderly. But here we have this blip in the, uh, in the um, uh, fit young adults. Uh, and of course, the, the death rates there were very high. So far, even though we've seen that tendency towards more illness in these, um, in these age groups than we have in the older age group, for the reason I said, uh, it doesn't look as though it's systemic shock. I think as far as people can work out, it's just a very high growth virus that's causing the problem. And in some people that are very susceptible, uh, that's, that's an issue. Of course, the genetics of that, it would be very interesting to probe. And I guess we're starting to get into the position where we can really start to do that. Um, the 1918 virus, as you know, wasn't isolated at the time. We didn't isolate the first flu virus until 1931, that was isolated by Richard Shope at uh, the Rockefeller, and it was isolated from pigs. Uh, Dick Shope was uh, uh, from, an Iowa, from Iowa, and Iowa has two things. It has a few people, and it has a hell of a lot of pigs. So he looked first in pigs and uh, found the flu virus in pigs. And then in 1933, uh, the first human influenza virus was isolated in ferrets by, at Mill Hill in London. Um, McFarlane Burnett, the, our great scientist was visiting Mill Hill at the time, and he, he recalls walking down the corridor, and someone ran towards him shouting, the ferrets sneezed, the ferrets sneezed. They, they, what had happened is someone had some extra ferrets, and they were trying to get rid of them, and the flu group took them on. They dropped flu down their nose. They all started to sneeze, and uh, not only that, they fulfilled Cox postulates by transmitting it to one of the flu investigators, Charles Stewart Harris. Uh, they were all knighted, including Sir Charles. Charles, there was no monument to the ferret. Um, and of course, uh, then, uh, then uh, Jeff Taubenberger and also Jonathan Halton, who uh, University of Iowa graduate actually, have been chasing this virus for a long time, um, went back and Halton, uh, Taubenberger was then at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology in Washington, D.C. He went back into uh, formal and fixed path, uh, paraffin embedded blocks and actually isolated some, a lot of the flu virus back by PCR. Uh, Halton got stuff out from uh, people who'd been buried in the permafrost up in Alaska and they reconstructed the virus. It's basically a mutant bird virus. It's extremely virulent uh, wherever they put it into um, uh, primates, uh, uh, mice and so forth under, under BL4 level conditions and it does cause a lot of cytokine production. Um, um, and what, what protections do we have against flu? Well, we've got the antivirals, Rolenza and Tamiflu. I won't go into that. There are many other antivirals being developed. Uh, the problem with antivirals is, of course, that uh, is, is markets for, for drug companies. I mean, a lot of these things are episodic. It's great with HIV because, uh, for the drug companies, I mean, uh, because you have to take the drug every day for the rest of your life or every month or whatever it is, depending on what the drug is. And so you've got a constant thing. The, the ideal target for any drug company is something you have to take every day. You know? So they're very interested in chronic arthritis and, and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, and, and it's problematic when you get to viruses which come along occasionally. Um, the um, other sorts of strategies that are being used to try what we're doing now is to trying to get antibodies that recognize uh, conf uh, 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 determinants that don't change on viruses, the, the conserved ones. Often they're in the stalk rather than the glycoprotein head of the viral HA. This is, uh, this is an antibody 2D1, which was actually uh, um, it was, uh, got out from a uh, I think from, um, from making monoclonal, human monoclonal antibodies. And it recognizes the cross-reactive part. Um, the, uh, can, we, can we in some way skew the immune response to recognize those skewed determinants? That's also the question that's being asked in HIV uh, by people like Dennis Burton. Uh, they do have antibodies that recognize these more cross-reactive parts of the virus, but it's extremely difficult to get any, anything to make those antibodies. They turn up occasionally, but how do we induce that response? That isn't understood. If we could do that with both flu and HIV, maybe we'd be in better shape uh, dealing with it. 
This is from Peter Palazzi. It's called the uh, headless hemagglutinin. They, I think it was the Charles I model. What they've done is uh, chop the head off the hemagglutinin, which then focuses the response onto the stalk of the hemagglutinin. Again, that would give us a much more cross-reactive response. And then the other, the other target is M2. Uh, there's another protein on the surface of the virus, the M2E channel protein, the M2 channel protein. And the external part, the M2E, is a potential target for neutralising antibody. There's been some success with that, uh, but the problem has been to get really good antibody teeters, and of course there's not much, that much of the protein on the virus. Uh, Dave Jackson at uh, Melbourne has had some success recently with new targeting uh, uh, structures that, uh, that where you can use a, a relatively short peptide epitope and get reasonable antibody responses. So maybe that will happen uh, uh, in trying to make a vaccine. The other target, of course, is the cellular immune response itself. Uh, the, the parts of the virus that are under particular immune selection are, of course, the antibody and the neuraminidase on the surface of the virus. These are under antibody-mediated selection. And so they change very quickly. And the general characteristic of a seasonal influenza virus is that it changes from the previous one. And so we get a new infection with that in the hemagglutinin, usually, also maybe the neuraminidase. But then we've got all these peptides, which with many of them, including most of the ones from humans and also pretty all the ones from C57 black mice, come from internal proteins. And these are the peptides that are presented in the cleft of the MHC glycoprotein. And these, though you do see mutational change in them in humans, you'll do see mutants of the nuclear protein arising. They don't arrive at anything like the frequency of the hemagglutinin mutants. So that, what that tells you is if those mutants are selected, is firstly because they're not arising at anything like the level that the antibody mutants are arising and being selected, then it's not as important a response. But secondly, it does say it can have some selective effect. And so uh, there's a lot of uh, interest now in trying to make vaccines that will also emphasise the T-cell compartment as well as the antibody compartment and maybe make a sort of belt and braces vaccine that produce, promotes both T-cell and antibody responses. Um, T-cell responses look like this. We infect a CBD7 black mouse, virus grows in the respiratory tract. Um, here's um, one of John Stamerson's infected experiments, actually. Here's, you've got no uh, T-cells. This is detecting with tetrama. That's the... MHC peptide tetramers that will bind to the T cell receptor on an on a antigen specific cell and allow us to detect these things in the flow cytometer. Here you see the response developing a primary response in the spleen and then you go down and you have this memory that goes on for the life of the mouse. Um, if we look at the response in the lung, this is getting the tetramer positive cells out of the lung. This is uh, tetramer there and the uh, um, CD8 uh, 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 molecule which characterises these T cells there. And here you can see the antigen specific T cells coming into the lung at about day seven after infection, uh, increasing in number, also concentrating because the numbers, of the, the magnitude of the inflammatory response is already starting to drop. And the virus is eliminated from the lung about here. Now, if you take all the other elements of the specific immune response out, you remove the antibody molecules, antibody response by using, say, a mu knockout mouse or remove the CD4 T cell response, then basically the CD8 T cells will still clear, uh, though a bit more slowly. Also, if you take the CD8 T cells out, the killer T cells that give you this response, the flu will also be cleared by antibody and uh, 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 mediated mechanisms. So the flu can be handled by either. This is a secondary response. We primed these mice up to give memory about seven months previously, which is about 30, 25% of the life of a lab mouse. Uh, if it's allowed to live that long, of course, and they're not alone normally. But uh, um, here we can see that even though the memory T cells were at physiological numbers, and you get a much bigger response on virus challenge with a cross reactive virus, it's still the T cells are still only there by about day five. So this is the problem with using the cellular response as a vaccine. It's not so much a problem for flu because with flu the virus doesn't persist, but with a persistent virus like HIV, the virus gets in. And if you're only relying on the cellular immune response, you won't stop the virus getting in, establishing and becoming persistent. And so you can't really make a vaccine against, say, HIV that just relies on the killer T cell or the CD8 T cell response. Though a lot of effort went into that, and uh, it was uh, non-productive in the end. It didn't work. Um, uh, there we are. 
Um, if we do prime up that response and we have these large numbers of T cells, then we can control the infection more quickly. The mice will still get infected. In the first 24 hours, you don't see the difference between a T cell prime mouse and an unprimed mouse. But depending on how much priming you have, how many T cells you have around, the virus will be eliminated more quickly and you will enhance survival. And we think that probably is also operating in humans.